a one hour talk in two hours. Now I'm trying to do a two hour talk in one hour. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> this is about animal movement in homogeneous space. So it's like a starting point for doing models of animal movement. <coughs> Before getting to that, let me say a little bit about the structure of, 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 of the lectures and exercises that, uh, that, that I and, and Hencho are, are giving. So I'm, I'm having these four lectures. Animal movement in homogeneous space. Then I'll switch a bit, little bit the order compared to the, what's set in the program. Next I'll talk about Bayesian state-based approaches, in the, not today but, but tomorrow. And then I'll go to modeling animal movement in heterogeneous space, which is what I told already, but I'll talk in more detail about that. And the exercises that Henshaw is running, they relate to these three lectures, basically these two first lectures. Okay? Lecture four is not so much teaching, it's, it's like more zooming out, like going from animal movement to population dynamics, evolutionary dynamics. If we don't have time, if you spend much time with these, I'll, I might actually skip this all together because this is like more optional. Uh, then a bit about the exercises. Uh, yesterday you had this introduction to R and analyzing movement data in R using these basic statistics, like not doing any kind of mechanistic modeling, but just looking at these distributions of turning angles and so on. For the rest of the week, in the exercises, you will focus on state-based modeling of animal movement, basically doing what I'm telling in this, this lecture and the next lecture. And it is structured so that there is like general material of state-based modeling, like a couple of pages explaining verbally, like what I'm explaining in the lectures, uh, explaining, I mean, not verbally, but written, the same stuff. <coughs> and then you have exercises one to six, which is basically starting from the simplest model and then going to a bit, bit more and more complex models, more realistic models. And finally, there will be something about the model selection in the exercises, but Henzo will add that to the document later. It's not yet there. <coughs> so, as you know, you will be kind of graded in the end of this course. That's what Rana was telling to, to us, that we have to grade somehow your performance. So, from kind of the finished part of the teaching, like me and Hensho, we will grade you based on what you do in the exercises. In the document, there is kind of a detailed uh, description of what we expect you to return from each of the exercises. So basically, we want you to play with R, do this exercise in R, and then kind of copy paste the results to whatever you find convenient, Word, uh, PowerPoint, and then write there some notes, like what you learned, describe what you are doing in the exercise. So it's described in, in this document. And to pass the course, the mandatory part is to do exercises one to three, plus this model selection exercise that will be added. But if you aim for a better grade, or hopefully if you aim to learn more, which is really the point of this course, then of course we would like you to, to do all the, all the exercises. Okay, any questions on this practical side? No? Then let's go on to talk about modeling movement in homogeneous space. Okay, before going to that I would just like to show some kind of movement data to remind that why we do this is that we, you know, we want to go to real data. So this is what I told you to already. There are a lot of more recapture data sets in the world. Actually, if you think, for example, on bird ringing data, it is this kind of data that the bird was observed somewhere in some ringing station and then somewhere later you saw it, saw it again. I told about this harmonic radar data. But of course, in, in, in this course, I, I think most of you, you are actually interested in something like this, like GPS data. This is some Finnish GPS data on, on wolf movements, a bit more than 100 individuals have been colored and this is all the movement this movements that they have done. This is like the core area of the population. You see a lot of home range, home range movements here. And then you see these dispersal events by young individuals. This might walk up to, you know, 1000 kilometers like, like, like this guy did. Sometimes they go to the Russian side. Some go come back, some don't. And 
as Ran was explaining, you know, this kind of data is really building up. You have now this for many, many organisms. So I think it's really essential to, to develop tools to, to deal with GPS data. Some of these data are uh, supplemented with other kinds of information, like, like was the case of the bats or vultures as well. In the case of this wolf data, <coughs> what they have done for small subset of the data, for example, this individual uh, which was doing home range movements around the den, which is here. So this is, a, I think, a female basically doing these hunting trips, leaving the home and coming back there. So they have visited every single location that they, they got for the whole summer period. I mean, fixes every, I think, half an hour in this case. So they went there with, with some trained dogs so they, they can find all the carcasses. So we also have good behavior information like when did the wolf pack kill and what did they kill. Okay, why we need movement models? In other words, why isn't it always enough to just to describe the data using descriptive statistics, like, you know, plot the turning angle distribution, plot net square displacement with respect to time? Or why isn't it enough to apply classical statistical approaches like linear models? Maybe you have other answers to this question, or maybe you even think that, you know, you don't really need movement models. <coughs> this is one list of answers. So I think movement models are really essential for developing theory, relating data to theory. Maybe half of the work that we do in my group is, is actually related to theory, so that it's not, you know, we don't necessarily use data, but we just do like theoretical development. I'm not talk going to talk about that here, but like we have been using movement models to do some theory for encounter rates. I, I'll mention that later. Uh, with classical statistical approaches such as linear models or with descriptive statistics, getting biologically relevant information out of movement data can be really challenging. I think there are at least two reasons for this. I will mention both of them in the next slides. But you, applying using movement models, like more mechanistic models of movement, they really enable one to, to go over this challenge. For example, by analyzing data in the context of Bayesian state-space models, as I was illustrating in my talk. So, two reasons why I think analysis of movement data is, is quite challenging. The first one relates to this movement ecology framework by, by Run and others. This is basically saying that movements are influenced by a lot of things. Okay, by the kind of the intrinsic properties of the species and the focal individual. All individuals are not identical. It's influenced by the present state of the focal individual, external factors such as landscape structure. And additionally, the observation method influences what kind of data you get on movements. So how to disentangle these factors? I just gave an example that related to this mark recapture data on the cloud with Apollo butterfly where I show that with the help of state space modeling which has some mechanistic movement model included you can at least to some extent separate the properties of the species the movement behavior of the species from the structure of the landscape the design of the study. The second reason why analysis of movement data is challenging <coughs> is illustrated by by this graph here, also from a paper by Ran, which is making the point that movements often take place at multiple scales, and then the processes that generate the movement patterns may vary among the scales. Like here we have movement steps at very small scale. If you look at like, let's say, maybe this is the daily time scale, you have this phase where you search for food, escape for predator, then again search for food. Here you have the life, lifetime track, which is composed of all of these different phases. One related concept is that, oops, is that of autocorrelation, which means that consecutive movement steps are not independent. So statistical testing using like classical approach, classical statistics can be quite challenging. <coughs> Just to make this point, let's look at this wolf data. This is like the 
form range movements, all the dots are the observations of, of, the, of the wolf in the summer based on the GPS data. And let's say that you are interested in the habitat use of that, indi of that species or that individual. Like how much does it prefer, let's say, conifer forests over mixed forests or swamps and so on. So to look at that, you can just plot these locations over on top of a map and see you know, whether they, you find the wolf more in a forest than some other habitat. Now, to illustrate what's the problem with the autocorrelation, let's assume that we would have only a small subset of the data, like only these locations which all, let's say, they come from the same day. Okay? What you see here is that the wolf is using only swamps and half open habitats. Okay. If you compare this realized use of habitat to, to what's available within the home range, if you apply a you know, statistical test for that, you would, say, you, you would say that it's highly statistically significant that the wolf is preferring these habitat types. Okay. This one? Hmm? This one? Yeah. The Peatland. Okay. I mean, it can be like a forested peatland. It's not necessarily, yeah, yeah. And this is, of course, not the case. If you look at the full picture, you see that it's actually quite generalistic. It's using all kinds of habitats. Okay. So what goes wrong if you just take this subset of data and apply a randomization test? Okay. What goes wrong is that these data are not independent data points because they come from the same day. Okay. And that's because movement data is always autocorrelated. If you were now here in the next sampling step you are likely to be somewhere close. Okay, and somehow you have to account for this autocorrelation. And applying movement models is one way of doing that because movement models kind of naturally account for the autocorrelation structure. Okay, still before I really go to the models, <coughs> I want to make the point that all models are simplification of, simplifications of reality. Okay? If you don't want to simplify, you know, just go out and see what's happening. There is a big simulation going out there. <coughs> no replicates, unfortunately, and it's pretty complex. So, you know, if you just observe, as, as many of you do, collect data, it's really difficult to see what's really going on. That's why we use models to simplify. But you can simplify to different, you know, degrees. If we talk about modeling movement, and I, I've been very much looking, be interested in the influence of habitat structure. So you can, you can take different approaches. A more realistic one, where you kind of start from a map of, of the landscape, as I did with the butterfly case study. Or you can take a bit more abstract description by viewing the landscape as a network of, let's say, habitat patches and the matrix. Or you can simplify even further by just going to homogeneous space, which is what I'm going to do in, in this lecture. So there is kind of a trade-off that simple models, they are tractable, uh, so they are nice to analyze, but complex models are more realistic. It doesn't matter, mean that complex models are kind of better in doing predictions because they are more detailed, you know, there is more parameters, there is more parameter uncertainty, so they are in a sense more specific. Simple models are more general in some sense. So something that I'll talk a little bit in some of the lectures is what's the optimal level of model complexity that leads to best inference in, in, the, in, the, in the end. Okay, so let's now go to the movement models in homogeneous space. And just to start from the very simplest, let's do a random walk in discrete space and dis discrete time. What I've been doing to, you know, to some of these slides is to, is to write small simulation codes or estimation codes, uh, not using MATLAB or not using R, just to confuse you even more to use a third language. So these are done in, in Mathematica. <coughs> uh, I will describe like verbally what this is doing because you know just the pseudocode is kind of more important than what's actually in the algorithm, what's the language. But anyway, I, I think you will get all these uh, talks as a PDF in the end. So if some of you are you know using Mathematica, you can you can read what the code is actually you doing. Mathematica is actually quite easy to read. I think you are able to understand by looking at the code. Okay, I printed this so small that probably you cannot see the code. 
So this is, you know, just to make the point that don't worry, I just explain what's, what the code is doing. But you can look at the details if you want. So this is a random walk in discrete space, so it's a, it's a lattice. I'm now here in this grid cell and I take one step, uh, let's say every second. So it's a discrete time model. I'm moving in this grid like this. And every time I move to one of these four directions with probability 0.25. So same probability for any direction. So this is a random walk in discrete space and discrete time. Uh, for a lot of the stuff that we are looking at, it's a bit more realistic to look at more or less with working continuous space, so that we don't have this underlying grid. So you could look at, I mean, one kind of central model is that of correlated, correlated random walk in continuous space, but still in discrete time. So again, you take these steps, movement steps, at fixed intervals, like once in a minute or whatever is your interval. And the idea is that you have some distributions of step lengths and some distribution of turning angles. So now I'm here, I just sample some step length from this distribution, I derive it randomly from this distribution, and the same for the turning angle, that tells where I go next, I move here, then I sample the next step length and turning angle that tells the direction where I go to and how far I go, and this is how you can simulate correlated random walk. This is step length, this is turning angle, this is what you all know from yesterday. This is a simulation <coughs> of a very simple case. I have a fixed step length, so L is 2 in, for all steps, and my turning angle is uniform in my, from minus pi to pi, which means that there is no correlation. This is the simple random walk. You get uh, movement paths that look like this. Step length is always the same and then the turning angle is random. I mean, random is a bad word. I should specify in which way it is random. It's like uniform distribution. We can make it a bit more realistic by defining a distribution for step lengths. For example, using the Weibull distribution. I think this is something that you already did in the exercises. So what we have here are three examples of a viable distribution, just with different parameters. Okay? What these show are the probability density for the step length. Okay? So like this curve here shows that if you apply this particular viable distribution, your mean step length will be 2, and typically they are between, let's say, 1 and 3. There is not much variation. If you apply this version of the viable distribution with some other parameters, you will see that most of the steps are very, very short, but then there is a possibility of taking occasionally long steps. Okay? And let's pick one of these distributions. The mean step length is 2. It was the same as the fixed step length in my example. But now a simulation of the process looks like this. That, <coughs> again, you start from the origin and then you take these 100 steps. Uh, turning angle is, is uniform, so it's like completely random. But sometimes you take long steps, sometimes you take short steps. Then let's make it a bit more realistic, again, by defining a distribution of turning angles. You can use Oh, I forgot to say something, which is that when you define a distribution for step lengths, of course, step length is a positive quantity, okay? So the distribution has to be oops, such that, that you have only positive values in the x-axis, okay? The viable distribution is one distribution that you can use for step length because it, it's restricted to positive values, okay? But when we go to step length, uh, you can, if you want to specify, when we go to turning angle, if you want to you specify a distribution for that, it has to be such that it, it has values between minus pi and pi, or, you know, CRO and 360 degrees. And one possibility for that is to use the von Mises distribution, 
there are other distributions as well. I think in the exercises you are using the wrapped COSI distribution. So the idea here is that this is from minus pi to pi. Zero means that you continue straight. And often these are peaked at zero, so that it's more likely to continue straight than to turn to some other direction. And, and you can vary the degree of how correlated the walk is by the parameters of this von Mises distribution. So I illustrate the same distribution with three different parameters. Well, in, I mean, now if you don't understand something, you should interrupt me because I kind of assume that you understand what I say and this is what you actually need to understand to apply the exercises. This is a simulation of the model. What I do in this do loop, I take 100 steps, is that I randomize step length from the viable distribution with parameters 1 and 2. Then I say that the absolute direction to which I'm going to is the previous direction plus a random variable that I think take from the von Mises distribution. Then I say that my new position is the old position times the step length times a vector which is given by the cosine and sine of the direction I'm moving to. And then I just add that location to the list of data that I've collected. I loop over 100 steps and then I just plot the data. It gives me this simulation where you see that there is variation in step length and you have a correlated random walk because there is some persistence in directionality in this case. Okay, so everything that's shown in these figures, I mean, all you need to do to generate this figure is to write this code here. So if you are interested in the details, you can, you can look at that. Okay, so this was uh, ran correlated random walk in uh, discrete time, but in continuous space. You can also do the, do the same in continuous time by saying that, that the interval t between the steps that you take is, is not fixed, it's not always like one minute, but it's also a random variable. So one way to do this is, is to assume that you have a distribution of intervals, basically waiting times. So that I, I wait here for a random time, maybe now I wait for two minutes, and then I take this step, taking the step is very fast compared to the waiting times. Then you wait again, maybe now I wait only half a minute, then I make a step and so on. There is one case which is mathematically like especially convenient, which is that of uh, exponentially distributed waiting times. Okay, because if you assume that the waiting time is exponentially distributed, then you have a Markov process. Which is basically a process which doesn't have memory. So it's, it's mathematically convenient. I'm actually not going to talk much about these models, but I mean, if you are interested, we can, I can tell more about them, like how you apply them in practice. But this, this is not all. I mean, you can do many, many other kinds of models. You can, for example, write down a model of velocity instead of a model of position. So is that if, maybe I miss you, but if you define uh, zero as a possible uh, distance, then the animal can still decide not to make uh, Yes, yes, one possibility is that, so, so you are saying that Zero is a possible distance to move. Okay, that I mean that's not the case. For example, with the viable distribution, it starts from zero, but the probability that you move exactly zero—that's zero. Okay, it, it doesn't happen in practice. So it doesn't kind of make sense to say that you take a step, but then the step length is zero. I think it's better to integrate that into the waiting time. Okay. So. Velocity uh, is, it, it's a vector, so it combines the, the speed at which you are moving and also the direction. Okay, so one way to parameterize a movement model is to describe what is the velocity. So 
I mean velocity is a vector, like let's say that it points to that direction. The length is like how fast I'm moving and the direction is where I'm moving. So now I don't take steps, discrete steps, but I move in a continuous fashion with this velocity. Okay? And then this velocity might change. It might, let's say, slow down. I still go to the same direction, but slower. And it might turn. Okay? If you know how the velocity is moving, changing over time, then you can figure out what is the position of the animal. Okay? That is what's said in the kind of more mathematically in this equation here that position z is an integral of velocity over time. Velocity is v. These are now bold letters because they are vectors. The position at time zero is the initial position plus an integral of the velocity from time zero to time t over time. This is what I was just describing, that if, if you know how velocity is moving, then you know where you are. So I said one more way to model movement is to write down a model for velocity, how velocity is changing in time. This is just one, one uh, possibility for that, uh, which is to assume that the velocity follows the so-called einstein uhlenbeck model. Uh, which is, this is the mathematical description. Here we have like white noise. This is saying that velocity is kind of changing randomly in direction and length and, and the speed. But then there is a tendency to return to some kind of uh, default velocity, which is this v mu, which is the mean velo velocity. And often you assume that that's zero because, you know, velocity has also a direction. So otherwise you have to say that you are, you know, going to some <coughs> given direction on average. Do you point it out? No. Okay. Uh, this is a stochastic differential equation. I'm not going to go into the details of the mathematics. But just to make the point that this particular model for velocity is, is kind of nice because it's, it's mathematically kind of convenient. It has this property that if you define this state x uh, as a property of these four parameters, the position, uh, the x and y coordinates of the position, and then the x and y coordinates of the velocity. This is like the full state of the system at given time. Then this vector evolves in a very simple way. It is a Markov process. And, and you can actually solve what is the state of this vector after any time delta t, not just after small time, but also after whatever long time. So there is a simple formula saying that this vector will be normally distributed. I mean, this is a multinormal distribution for, type four, for a vector of length 4 with some particular mean mu and some variance covariance matrix sigma, which you can figure out how they look like in terms of the model parameters the present state of the system and the length of this interval. Okay? And this is nice because you know if you do, for example, uh, likelihood-based inference, you can quite easily figure out what's the likelihood of, of, of your data. Also, you can you can use this to figure to do simulations. Like this code here is all you need to do to write down a simulation of this, this model. What I'm doing here is to start in from some initial condition for the velocity and location. And then I'm just applying this multinormal distribution to sample where I'm in the next time step. What is my location? What is my velocity? If I do this, I get this kind of tracks. <coughs> okay? Looks a little bit like correlated random walk, but this model is actually in, in continuous time. Okay. So, so these dots here, which are like the, the points where I really, you know, figured out where the individual are, is, they are of course in discrete time. But this is only for the sampling of the process. But the underlying model is, is truly continuous. Okay. Uh, these kind of models that I described so far, you can think that they are kind of building blocks. Okay that describes some kind of mode of movement. If you 
want to look at movements at a larger time scale so that you have different phases, then you can combine these building blocks with the model of behavioral switching. So this is just one example of that. Let's assume that we have a foraging stage and the dispersal stage. The foraging state is maybe characterized with like short movement steps and wide turning angles, whereas the dispersal stage <coughs> might be characterized by long movement steps and, and quite directed movements. And then there are some transition probabilities between these two. So if you are now in a foraging mode, maybe you have a quite low probability of turning into dispersing mode. If you are dispersing, then you, there's some probability by which you switch back to foraging mode. So this is the simulation of that model. <coughs> exactly the same code that I had earlier, but I, I have one more state variable here, which is mode. I start from mode one, which is foraging. And then I just randomize a random number every uh, iteration route where I check whether I switch to the other mode, okay? And then the distribution that I apply for the viable distribution, one minus distribution, the parameter depends on which mode I am. The movement tracks that this model generates look like this. So you can clearly see that like here, you were in the foraging mode, you are moving short distances back and forth, and here you were in the dispersing mode and so on. So much of the rest that I will talk about is like of a homogeneous movement model in the sense that there is no switching between any states. But what you should remember is that these are just like building blocks that you can, you can use to, you know, uh, to combine to have a more realistic description of, of long-term movements. All right. So I've described quite many movement models so far. And there are, I, I didn't tell all of them. I mean, there exist even many, many more. There are diffusion models, correlated random walk models, sto stochastic differential equation models, Levy flights, individual based simulation models, and so on and so on. So what is really the right model that you should apply? I mean, you, you want to analyze some data. If you use a state space approach, you, you, you just have to select one of these. Which one should you select? This is a pretty tough question. <coughs> uh, you know, all models are wrong, but some may be, might be more useful than others in the sense that they are more close to reality. But also, does it really matter which model you pick for your analysis? Okay. What I show here are simulations of one particular model. This is again correlated random walk in discrete time. I can get different kinds of movement trajectories, like more directed, more random, depending on how I vary the movement parameters. Let's say that I'm interested in modeling butterfly flight. Okay, this one looks pretty good to me. I could select this, maybe. Uh, let's then do model B. This is correlated random walk, but in continuous time. Okay, so again, by varying the parameters of the model, I can get different trajectories, movement tracks, more directed, less directed. This also looks pretty good to me for butterfly flight. Maybe I'll pick this model. That, that's, that's the mean cosine of the turning angle in this model, okay. Or let's try this model C, the ornstein uhlenbeck model for velocity which I just described to you. This is a really different model. It's, it's, it's very different than the correlated random walk models like mathematically. But still, you can generate kind of similar movement tracks, more directed or more random. So also this one looks pretty good for a butterfly model. So it's, it's not kind of straightforward which one is the right model. But I, I think the relevant question is that how much do the model specific, specific details really matter? And I think the good news are that, uh, at least in my opinion, often they don't matter very much. So this kind of claim is based on a paper that we had with Eli Kurari, who was my postdoc. 
uh, last, last year in MNAT. <coughs> so the main idea of this paper is that the key parameters of movement are just these two, sigma and tho, which are basically the spatial and temporal scales of movement. Okay? So these are like two parameters that you can compute for basically any given movement model. And our, let's say, working hypothesis was that if you just know these two parameters, they kind of determine much of the interesting, you know, behaviors of movement, much of the ecologically relevant uh, behaviors of Except movement. When infinite, no? Sorry? Except when they're infinite. Uh, let me first define what, what they are. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, you can combine these two in this way, sigma squared over 4 tau, tau to give the diffusion coefficient of the model. Okay? This will tell what happens at large times. Okay? Basically, it's saying that in, I didn't specify what class of models I'm talking about, but I'm talking about quite a general class of models, but models which don't have, le let's say, long-term long memory, they don't have a tendency to return to a central area. They are basically models of some kind of random walk models in uh, infinite space. Okay. In this class of models, eventually, at long times, you will always have this feature that the mean squared displacement grows linearly with time. Okay with this diffusion rate. And if you know these two parameters, you know what happens at long times. But you also know something about what happens at, at short times. Okay? Uh, that's kind of illustrated in these graphs. What I show in this is this VAF, which is the velocity autocorrelation function. It's written out in the next slide more with the help of an equation, which is basically saying that you know, if I'm now going to this direction, with this speed, uh, how long is that going to take? How, how long, uh, what is the persistence in this velocity? So that if I go back after one minute, am I still going to go roughly to that direction, roughly to that speed? I mean, eventually I will go to some other direction, some other speed. So how uh, long does it take to forget to which direction, which speed you were doing? That is what is this velocity autocorrelation function is telling to you. Correlation is decaying with time, time lag between two uh, steps, and then how fast this decays with time, that's what we call the temporal scale of movement. I mean, we define that as the time lag when this velocity autocorrelation function hits the value of 1 over uh, e. And the reason why these movement tracks that we, I, I got from these models A, B, and C, why they kind of look the same, why these black things look the same, why the blue things look the same, why the red things look the same, is that these two parameters are the same for all of those three, three models. So I just selected the original model parameters in such a way that they produce the same spatial and temporal scales of movement. That's why they have the same velocity autocorrelation functions, and that's why they have the same diffusion rate. Okay? And now we were thinking that, you know, just these two parameters might be enough to predict like some ecologically relevant quantities. This, oh, before going to that, this is just the mathematical definitions. So at long time scales, all movement models in this class of models lead to diffusion. So Z is your location. Z T minus Z zero is the displacement. That's like the vector telling where you got, uh, which uh, from the initial location. Then you take the absolute value. That's like to what distance you got to. You square it. Then you take the expectation. So like the average over simulations, if you like. This is the expected squared displacement. And that behaves linearly as a function of time. And here we have D, this diffusion rate. And at short time scales, movement behavior can be characterized by this velocity autocorrelation function. So we look at what's, what's the velocity vector now, what is, what is this after time like delta t. We take the dot product, the expectation over that, we scale it by the variance of velocity to get the correlation. 
And in this class of models, it behaves typically exponentially as a function of the time lag. If we go back to the previous graph, actually it behaves exactly exponentially for correlated random walking continuous time and for the ornstein uhlenbeck model for velocity. So these lines here, they are like the analytical predictions and the dots are based on the simulations. I mean, for si these simple models, we can just solve what is the velocity autocorrelation function. For this discrete time random walk model, it doesn't behave exactly exponentially. You, you will see these kind of corners here because the model is in discrete time. But I mean, essentially, it's kind of ex exponential. So here the y-axis is the velocity autocorrelation function, which is this one here. This is the definition for it. And in practice it tells you how fast you forget to which direction you were moving. Okay, so the hypothesis that we got made is that these two parameters <coughs> are maybe sufficient for describing many essential aspects of movements and we call them the characteristic spatial and temporal scales of movement. This is kind of the test of that hypothesis that, for example, can they predict encounter rates. We did some simulations where we have some d distribution of targets, let's say habitat patch that you try to find, either like a random distribution, aggregated, regular distribution. You drop an individual to a random location within this world, I mean, I, I plotted a circle, but it's really an infinite landscape in which we do the simulation. It's not confined in space. And then you apply a given movement model, model A, B or C. You wait until you hit one of the targets. You repeat this million times to get the hitting time, like the first hitting time, how long it takes on average to find a habitat patch. What we see in this graph is that there is, of course, a lot of variation in the hitting time depending on, you know, how the habitats are structured, uh, what is the density of targets, what are the movement rates of the individual. But the key thing here is that all these three models, A, B and C, they always give pretty much the same prediction within the kind of the confidence bars. I mean, this is based on a finite set of simulations. Which is saying that it doesn't really matter if you ask this question using like the Ornstein Uhlenbeck model or the correlated random walk model. If you just know what are the scales, sigma and tau, you can predict what is, for example, the first uh, hitting time. Okay? What's the, y, uh, the x axis? Uh, x axis is like the scale of movement. I mean, we, we just vary the spatial and temporal scales. To simplify, we, we, we set them to the same value. So this is both sigma and tau. So if you have like more directed movements, if you go more straight, you take longer steps, then of course the first hitting time is lower than if you take small steps. Okay. How much I have time? Oh, still 10 minutes, not too bad. <coughs> what, what is the spatial scale again? You said the temporal scale is the time that it takes you. Forget it's so close. Mm. So you can think of the spatial scale as you know how far you get typically within this time scale of the of this temporal scale. So if you do simple random walk that, that you just take you know fixed step length and always like a uniform turning angle so that you forget immediately, then you can think that the step length is the tem spatial scale. And then the time interval is the temporal scale. The mean displacement. Huh? The mean displacement is the temporal scale, not the Mean displacement. The mean displacement, you just showed that it's uh, equal to the mean displacement. Uh, sigma uh, W is uh, 4 dt, right? And sigma is uh, 2 squared. Yes? Yeah. Yes, I mean, so we, we mean not the mean square displacement, but the mean displacement. Yeah, sigma is the mean displacement. Yeah. That's right, not the mean square. So, so it's kind of natural to think of the, what happens at the last scale in terms of the diffusion rate, which is, you know, you, area is like the unit is like of area, not of distance. Okay, area over time. 
but then we just translate that into this spatial scale of movement because it's more easy to interpret. That's like the, let's say, the step length. Okay. I, I just want to make a short uh, side note about encounter processes because I mean, often we are interested about them. So we again did some work with, with Eli Kurari on the encounters. Uh, what I showed in this graph is like, what is the first encounter rate? You start from a random location, how, does it, how long does it take before you hit any of the targets? But you can actually, I mean, you can define encounter rates in, in many different ways. So this is just one kind of taxonomy of how you might define an encounter rate. <coughs> there is the type of rate, first encounter rate, which I talk about, or mean encounter rate. Mean encounter rate is that, you know, you. You just go on moving and, and you encounter things many, many times and you ask what's the mean time between encounters, essentially. It's different from the first encounter rate. Th then you can think of different target dynamics. dynamics. Like in this case, these, these patches, they are the targets that you try to find. So those targets, they can be like static or they, they can be dynamic, so they can disappear and appear again. What is the nature of the encounter? It can be like destructive or non-destructive. If this is like predator prey, it's destructive. When you have an encounter, you know, the target disappears. If it's non-destructive, like you have the butterfly and the patch, you find the patch, it's still there. And then there's the type of the encounter. It can be what we call here hard or soft. Hard means basically that uh, that this is the target, or let's say that the target might be, you know, something here, and then there is maybe a detection radius. Okay, I'm moving here. Once I get within the detection radius, I immediately, with probability one, I I find the target. That's a hard encounter. The soft encounter is is something like this. Uh, here, these dots, they are the targets that I'm trying to find. They are all associated with this kind of an encounter kernel, which is basically what's the probability that I will encounter this if I'm at some given distance from the target. Okay, it's higher if I'm close, smaller if I'm far away. And so you can think that you kind of move in this kind of landscape of, of these kind of encounter kernels, which are summed up. So the, so the <coughs> color here is still like the probability that you encounter any of the targets if you are in that location. So then you get to things like inst instantaneous encounter rate and cumulative encounter probability. What's the probability that after you have done all this movement, you still haven't encountered any of those. So this is like a soft encounter. And depending on which you know, combination you select, sometimes you can work it out analytically, what's the result? Like, you know, for this soft, mean encounter rates, you, you just have this prediction that is like the density of targets rho times the encounter rate, which is the integral of the, this encounter kernel. This is your encounter rate in any situation. Doesn't depend on, you know, what's the property of the movement, what is the structure of the landscape. You will always get this. So there is no need to simulate those models. You can just solve it. L let me finish this sentence. In some other cases, you actually have like kind of trivial predictions. Like if you look at the mean encounter rate for static target dynamics, non-destructive encounters, hard encounters, it will be infinite. Okay? For the reason that I explained that in 2D, you always come back to the same place. So you are kind of hitting the targets like, you know, infinitely often in a sense. In some case, you, you know, you have zero in 1D, 2D, something non-trivial in 3D. So it's, it's basically these first encounter rates which are more tricky to figure out. So here we just say that there are some functions of the geometry of targets, the properties of the movements and so on. And then you can solve this only in special cases. And, and is the destructiveness is uh, defined for the random walker for the target? It means that when you hit the target, when you find the target, you eat it away. Okay, it's it's not any it's not any more there to be found again. Okay, but like if like if you are a butterfly and the target is a patch, you don't eat the entire patch. It's still there. You can, you might come back. They can be described for the random walker. If the uh, if the target is a trap, then the butterfly. Goes. 
Yeah, sure. One yeah, application of sure yeah, happens. yeah. I mean, one application is of this is, I mean, encounters are relevant for many many things. Like you know, not only like predator prey and so on, but also for trapping because that's an encounter process. That is a destructive encounter the, if the individual is stays in the trap. So, so can you just um, explain what you Oh, you mean like these simulations? Yeah. They, they are in continuous space and then uh, like some of the, oops, sorry. Some of the models are in discrete time, some of the models are in continuous time. If we are applying a continuous time model, then sometimes we can simulate it. I mean, we can simulate all of those exactly, also the continuous time models in continuous time, but, but sometimes we, we can, we sample the locations in discrete times. But you know, if you, if you run a Markov process in continuous time, you randomize the time until next event from an exponential distribution, and then you figure out what's the next event. But yeah, I mean, yeah. But basically, like you apply something like the Gillespie algorithm. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I'm just wondering when you talk about uh, two objects that are moving, and then if you ask me, you have continuous time, if you ask me, yeah. So it's, it's confused, Okay. Get a bit confused, but that's okay. No, let's let's chat me and you later on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I'm almost done. At least I I should be. So now just to make the point that the the choice, I mean, I made the point that often the choice of the model doesn't matter so much, which I think is like really good news because it's really confusing that you know you have these 20 models. But, but that's only based on diffusion equation. It's in the world of, of, of regular diffusion. When you go to an amorous diffusion, it's... Sure, it's sure. This is within this class of models, but you know, even within this class of models, you have like 20 models to pick from. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Within this class of models. Okay. And, and within like, you know, one mode of movement. Okay. okay. But you know, like often people fit really detailed individual based models with 20 rules, which fit, which actually belong to this class of models. Okay, and then maybe many of these parameters are kind of redundant. So the choice of the model that you are applying to, of course, depends on the data and the question. Like in these two cases, we are looking at butterfly movements. You can think that the movement process is pretty much the same. But in this case, you know, we have detailed data. So it makes sense to try to estimate both the spatial and temporal scale of movement. Whereas in this case, we only have this sparse data. Observations between, you know, several days. There's no chance to say what is the temporal scale of movement. And that's why you simplify further and only estimate the diffusion rate. If you have, you know, really, really detailed data, then you can complicate your model more. Then you don't play it just with these two parameters, but you have a more full description of movement. Okay, then eventually a little bit about the link between random walk and diffusion. So this is something that Patlak showed already in the 1950s that at large time scales also these correlated random walks can be approximated by diffusion. So the point here is that uh, this is like the difference uh, between these uh, I mean, if you simulate the correlated random walk, you start from this particular location and then you are simulating one realization of the process. You know that next you are here, next you are there and so on. But you can also look at that from the point of the probability. Like if you would do like, you know, infinitely many replicates and you start from here, what's the probability that you would be an, in a certain location after some time? So, so this is what the diffusion equation is telling you. So here V is the probability that the individual is at some location x, y at time t. It's, or it's the probability density, more correctly. And the diffusion equation looks like this. It's a partial differential equation. This is, this is the derivative with respect to time. It's telling how v changes in time. Here we have the diffusion rate. Here we have the Laplace, Laplacian operator. So these are the second spatial derivatives. And then 
this is like the mortality rate here. So the point is that if you start from the center, like in this one dimensional case, after some time t, the probability density for where the individual is looks like this. This is, I mean, the solution is the Gaussian distribution. So it's most likely that you are still here where you were released, but you might be somewhere else. And now in my previous talk, I illustrated how this probability density evolves in a more realistic case in 2D heterogeneous space. So you can kind of, if you know the parameters of the correlated random walk, you can figure out what is this uh, diffusion coefficient d. And then you can work with probabilities instead of the realizations. This is just to illustrate diffusion in two dimensions. Initially we start from the center, so this is kind of the Dirac delta distribution. All these black lines here, they are just the computational grid, so they are not part of the biology. If you start from there, this is how the probability density of your location evolves over time. Okay, it's just a Gaussian kernel with an increasing variance. And if you integrate over that, it always gives one because for certain you are somewhere unless you have uh, unless you have mortality in the model. Why are some of the triangles smaller? Uh, it's just because the computational grid was like that. You will see it later when I talk about heterogeneous models. It's because the landscape is really heterogeneous here. Uh, you can extend from this basic diffusion model to, so, to diffusion advector reaction models. I'll talk more about this when I talk about heterogeneous movement, but just to mention them now. In these graphs, this dot is like your location now at time zero, and then the circle gives the 50 percent quantile for your location after some time t. So if you apply just regular diffusion like I did, you just you know have this circularly radially symmetric distribution around your present location. You can apply diffusion advection, which means that additionally to diffusion, which is this kind of random walk part, you have advection, which is like a force pushing you to one direction. So now the expected position is not around where you were last time, but it's somewhere else. Like now it's here because you have advection pushing you to this direction. On top of that, you have random part the diffusion. This advection might model, let's say, a wind pushing the butterfly to one direction. It might model home range movements, in which case the, the advection looks like this, that, that the direction depends where you are. It's kind of pushing you towards the home range center. That's one way to apply advection. Or you can have diffusion reaction. Now the reaction term is the mortality term, which is illustrated. By the fact that now this is not a you know black circle, it's a gray one, it means that it integrates to less than one. Or you can have anisotropic diffusion, so that this is not a circle but it's an ellipse. I'll illustrate why this is relevant in a in a later talk. What, what do you mean by reaction is mortality? What is okay, so I mean this is the technical di description of uh, diffusion advection reaction models. So. Diffusion is this part, it's the second spatial derivatives, that's like the random part of movement. <coughs> Advection is this part, which is like the first spatial derivative, that's like the you know, force pushing you to some direction. And then this is called the reaction term. It doesn't have any spatial, it doesn't have any derivatives, it's just the function itself. And because I'm, lo I'm not looking at population dynamics now, I'm just modeling the movements of a single individual. Okay, I'm not looking at reproduction. So that's, I, I'm only looking at mortality, that's why I have a minus sign here. So now this reaction term models mortality. Okay, but it can also model population growth. And this diffusion advection reaction, it's just a you know, mathematical terminology to call these terms. All right, I'm done. This is the conclusions. I have a question about freeze. Sure. Just to make sure I understand the difference between advection and anisotropic. Uh -huh. Advection is, is like a force that always pushes you to the same location, whereas diffu uh, advection, uh, anisotropic diffusion is, is something that's directional, it's, on, it's the same direction always, not the same location. Yeah, otherwise, <coughs> oops, sorry, except that this uh, advection doesn't necessarily always push you to the same 
you know, location, like in this home range model. You can use advection also to look at this kind of a field that's pushing you all the time to the east, for example. That's but, but isotropic. No, no, this is advection. This is not anisotropic diffusion. So the distinction is that the expected next location in, in the case of advection is not where you were, okay? Whereas in the case of anisotropic diffusion, it's still the expected location is exactly where you were. But let's say that I'm, I'm moving faster in these directions than in these directions. That would be anisotropic diffusion. So it's symmetrical, the anisotropic diffusion is always symmetrical to both sides oh, and not uh, circle-wise? Like always to the left and the right the same? Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let, let, let's assume the case that, you know, uh, I move less in that direction than in that direction, okay, it's like this. What I can do is to take the difference, put that to the advection term, which is pointing now to this direction, that's the difference, and then the rest is symmetric. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why this is enough to, to do the general case. So, the conclusions. Even in homogeneous space and time, there are many movement models to choose from, and in a sense there are like too many movement models to choose from. Even though I was, you know, talking about really kind of restricted class of models, as you pointed out, like, you know, Levy walks, things, other things I, I mean, I didn't include. Luca will tell, tell about them in, in more detail, but even in the most classical, simplest, you know, set of models, you have really many different kinds of models, and, and, and <coughs> it's kind of easy to get lost in the details, you got to know that models should be as simple as possible, of course not simpler from, than that. And then the question is that what kind of model is, is the best choice for the, for the question that you are looking at, for the data you are looking at. Uh, complex models can be kind of simplified in many ways. I, I only talk about one way in this talk, which is to find effective parameter combinations. Uh, in this case I, you know, found these spatial and temporal scales of movement, they were like parameter combinations that were kind of told much about the movement behavior. You have also other methods by, by for example, you can take different scaling limits, well diffusion is one scaling limit. And one of the statements that I made is that in this simple class of models, I think the spatial and temporal scales of the movement, they capture at least some of the essential properties of movement, both over short and and long time scales, and they, they can be used kind of a unify, unifying currency, which you can use to compare different movement models. You know, somebody fitted the correlated random walk to that organism, somebody else, an austin Uhlenbeck model to that organism. You want to compare, you know, which one moves faster. You can't compare directly, but you can convert the models to these parameters, and then you, then you can compare. Okay, thanks very much. Take a break. Ten minutes. Ten minutes break. Ten minutes. Yeah. Ten minutes. Ah. Ten minutes.